All right, everyone, we're going to get started here. Grab a seat. Get ready for some windows raping. <laughs> All right, so welcome to the last talk of RubyConf. Uh, I'm going to call it the headliner talk uh, in, in the rock star terms. Uh, let's give a hand to Chad and Rich and David for all the hard work they put in. I don't know if they're here, but this is awesome. It's been great. And uh, I want to talk to you guys a little bit today about uh, exploiting with Ruby. Um, so the first question I've gotten all weekend is what on earth are you talking about? Um, Ruby has uh, kind of infiltrated the security community. And it's done a lot of really cool stuff recently and spawned a lot of really cool projects and subsets of projects uh, in the way of using uh, Ruby to deliver payloads and exploits to systems. So now that I've given a brief overview about what that is, uh, I'm Aaron Bedra. I work for Go Now Do, a uh, little web startup in San Francisco. Um, we'll have some stuff this uh, January, February to launch for everybody to see. It's a travel industry startup. Kind of a fun little thing going on, so look forward to that in the future. Uh, first question, what is secure? Does anybody have an idea? Anything, shout it out, feel free. What is secure? <laughs> I like those answers, but we need to function. We need to function in society, so what is secure? <laughs> Absolute paranoia is not acceptable. Uh, anything, no? Fort Knox. <laughs> Not even Fort Knox. Secure than the next website over. That's true. Well, that's not fair. Uh, there is no such thing as secure. Security is a state of risk tolerance. Um, you can only measure the tolerable or acceptable levels of risk to define your sense of security or state of security. State of security is a state of mind. Um, it's a sense of self-satisfaction that a lot of people uh, kind of portray, especially people in the antivirus world, in the anti-spyware world, saying if you install our product, you will be secure. We will help you function better in, in, in your day-to-day -day computing. So a little bit uh, about what you guys, I, I get this question a lot too. Everybody says, what are you talking about? There is no way to, to define security. There's no way to define risk. Risk is, there's this objective nature about everything that you're talking about. I don't get it, you're full of it, you know, go away. It's, it's, it's one of these things that everybody tries to portray as something nobody else can do. So we define it how we can, we move on, and the rest of the security world says, this, this product will make you secure. So I wanna talk about the beauty of an attack. Everybody's been talking about the beauty of things today, so I wanna talk about the beauty of an attack. So let's give ourselves a scenario. What happens when an attack happens on a computer? So we're going to say that uh, we have a harmless program and we have a PC. So this PC is going to ask Windows, or the PC hiding today is going to say, I'm bloated as usual. That's our, 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 our regular response. So he says, I want to go ahead and run. The Windows, so the PC says, sure, go ahead and run. But meanwhile, it's sneaking up on the, on the, on the PC. And that's it. All of a sudden, Windows or the PC is dead. <laughs> that poor, poor PC. So, one of the things that uh, we, we learn a little bit about is things that are disguised as normal, uh, you know, normal programs, perceived as normal uh, routines, things that you can, can trust in a world maybe you've trusted before even, can always turn out to be werewolves. Thanks, Evan. So, let's call CSI and talk about the tools we can use to accomplish this. What's that? <laughs> so let's talk about the tools that we have that not everybody really knows about. 
There's a bunch of libraries in Ruby. Uh, I'm going to talk about Metasploit today. Metasploit's built on top of a whole bunch of other libraries. Um, these are, for the most part, open source BSD license libraries. There's a couple of things in Metasploit that are under the LGPL and also the MSF license, but mostly the Rex parser and a lot of the core Ruby libraries are BSD licensed and you can use them uh, however you'd like. Uh, Zed's RFuzz library is also another tool or another library that I really like to use if you're doing any kind of security stuff. Uh, RFuzz is really a nice library. Uh, Zed's done a good job with that. But Metasploit is the big topic of my talk today. So how many of you have heard of Metasploit, or used Metasploit? Awesome. There's actually more hands than I expected. Um, Metasploit is a framework for creating and delivering exploits and payloads into a system. It's got a full set of features that allows you to code, a, code an exploit, code a payload, and then use the framework to deliver those things to get whatever results you desire. Uh, still waters do run deep. Metasploit was launched uh, by a guy named H.D. Moore, uh, Breakpoint Systems. Uh, he's a very, very uh, talented hacker. Um, it was written in Perl originally. Uh, first two versions were written in Perl and uh, had quite a few uh, really break, break, uh, breakthrough discoveries in security, really an eye-opening experience. It kind of evened the ground out for uh, hackers, for people to really be able to get pretty powerful with things and also raise a level of script kitties up to a intolerable level, but we'll talk about that later. Um, the first two frameworks, like I said, were written in Perl. Uh, Perl on Windows is terrible. There was a paradigm. How do we move forward in the project? How do we make this viable on a cross-platform environment? Perl and Windows, you get ActiveState, you get Sigwin, there's a couple other you know, processes uh, that you can use, but ultimately it's not that good. So the search for a new language came on. The hunt for a new language came on. Perl threading never matured. It had a hackish OO model. And then there was the looming question of Perl 6. You know, when's it coming out? What's it going to do? Uh, there, there was just this, this really unanswered question. Um, so the project moved forward to another language and chose Ruby. Why Ruby? Um, most of these questions can be answered by everyone in the room. That's pretty easy to, to, uh, to figure out. But the main ideas were the platform independent threading, the cross-platform support, the consistent OO model, and the best of all, it's fun to write and it's really easy to read. Uh, you know, most people call Perl the right only language uh, for a good reason. And that's all good and well, but what can you do with the framework? So how many of you are familiar with uh, the concept of writing an exploit or delivering an exploit to a system? A few hands. So Metasploit breaks this up into two areas, exploits and auxiliaries. Exploits being the full-on, full disclosure. Uh, these, are, these are going to take control of a system, deliver the payload, and do whatever the payload does. Um, that, uh, we'll talk about the payloads here in a little bit as well. Uh, but as far as the auxiliaries are concerned, there's some scanning tools. Um, there's tools to check out um, NetBias, SMB, uh, just rent different things on a network about a machine that you can use for enumeration and fingerprinting, trying to find out the best attack vector on a machine. So the auxiliaries are there for that specific purpose. And the exploits also depend on these payloads. Uh, these payloads are delivered via encoders and no-ops. Um, they're staged, uh, split out into a process where the system can understand them and uh, it won't really throw the system out of bounds or crash the system. The idea is not to crash it, it's to take control of it. So there's been some careful procedures and code put in place to make sure that the payload you deliver isn't gonna just crash the system and keep moving. So exploits trigger the vulnerability. You know, exploits are the way into the system. They're going to say, this is, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a DCOM RPC request. I want to, I want to have some information. And it's going to say, okay, what do you want? And, it's gonna, and I'm going to say, well, I want this. And then all of a sudden, it's going to crash the stack. And uh, hopefully, if you've done it properly, uh, you're going to take control of the memory registers needed to take control of the ex execution instruction pointer the address ranges you need to point to the payload you've just delivered and take over the system. Now by doing this, forces the payload ex execution and uh, delivers 
whatever you've given to the system as far as a payload is concerned. Metasploit has a few, we'll talk about them in a bit. Uh, the most common is just getting a shell back. I want, I want an administrative shell, I want to just kind of take control of the system and, and type in the shell. We've got some really cool ones that are much, much better than having the shell. Uh, the most important piece of this is the encoding and the no-op uh, pieces. These are the things that make this possible. Uh, without this, it wouldn't be possible to have an exploit uh, deliver a proper payload and really get there to maximum efficiency and not crash the system. Uh, the no-ops really are a sequence uh, of assembly that just pads, uh, pads in places of memory so the system doesn't uh, freak out about uh, the size of blocks or the size of chunks that you deliver uh, in the payload. Um, the encoders are really nice. They help IDS evasion. Um, you know, if you're trying to do this in a stealthy sort of way, you don't want to set off a bunch of red flags on the IDS by, by acting like strange, strange uh, behavior. Uh, IDS, I'm sorry? Intrusion detection systems. Um, networks are designed to have uh, intrusion detection to find out if somebody's doing something bad. And these systems have gotten very advanced over the years. They've done a lot of research. Uh, HoneyNet is one of the leading research uh, companies, or the HoneyNet project, uh, I guess, uh, would be one of the leading researchers on signatures of attacks, of viruses, of things going around the net, and they've cataloged this very well. So if you just use a plain old you know, brute force attack, an IDS is going to pick that up and set off red flags, and you're going to get caught. Uh, depending on what you're doing, you can go to jail. You know, get, There's all kinds of really bad things that can happen. So. You know, if you're, and if, also if you're trying to test your network, uh, you know, if you're trying to find out if your network is safe uh, and you're attacking a machine, you can find out if uh, you can successfully evade your own IDS uh, inside of a network to, uh, to research the security of your own company. Obviously with permission, that's a big with permission, don't do it without, you will lose your job. Um, but the examples that we have for payloads, um, this will work for Windows, Unix, Linux, um, BSDs, Solaris, there's all kinds of exploits out there. You know, every, every operating system can be exploited at some point or another. It's got a hole. Um, lots of lower level programs you install in your system will have availability to system calls. Those can be exploited as well. So there's a whole lot of, of, of exploit uh, code inside of Metasploit that can take advantage of these things. And the Metasploit framework allows, to, allows for staging uh, of these of these things to make sure that no matter what size it is, it still gets delivered properly to the system. Uh, the Meterpreter is Metasploit's interactive shell. Uh, when it was rewritten in Ruby, it was done uh, to also include an IRB session available to the attacker after the payload's been delivered. So not only can you do a set of commands that we've given PS, you know, your standard API extensions to find out what's going on in the system. Um, but we also have an IRB set that you can open up. When you can play with processes, you can migrate into others, you can hide yourself, you can change timestamps on files, and I'll demonstrate a whole bunch of that here in a minute. And essentially what it's done has been, we've created a DSL for exploiting. This makes it a really easy way to write exploits and to manipulate uh, a machine when you're taking, a, taking control of it. And why is this so cool? So, when you've uploaded something, you can do whatever you want. You have administrative control of the system. The, the, you have the keys to the kingdom. It is yours. Uh, so really, you can dump the password hash. You know, Obviously, you have control of the system, but maybe you want to find out the passwords and give them to somebody else. Uh, you want to break in later without having to re-exploit the system. Um, some of the exploits also come with patches, which means that once they've been exploited, it also patches the system, so it can't be exploited again. Um, so you want to be able to grab passwords for later. Uh, you want to upload further programs. You want to upload a password sniffer. Uh, you want to upload. You want to upload a, a modified uh, you know, login DLL you've, you've created for Windows. Anything you want, uh, you can do to uh, the system to upload when you're done. Um, and one of those nice things is you can actually trade the timestamps on files. Let's say you modify one of the system files. Well, the system file. Uh, modified access created dates are that of when you install the system. So if you upload a new file and it doesn't match the rest of them, the antivirus is going to say, hey, why has this file been changed? 
And it's usually going to say, this contains a virus. It's got this signature that says, this is not right. Why was this accessed? Why was this changed? So you can actually change those attributes with Metasploit back to the original so that it looks like you were never there or never modified anything. And I'll also show you that you can grab process IDs, spawn new ones, and then migrate yourself into them uh, to hide yourself as you're kind of going around and fooling around in the system. Metasploit has three interfaces. Uh, there's the console, which I'm going to show the bulk of my hacks off with. It's the easiest to get on the screen and get everybody to see. Um, so I'll show off the web one if I have time. The web is actually a Rails app built inside of Metasploit. Uh, it's got a nice new Ajax interface, a lot of really cool stuff. There is an exploit IDE um, in the upcoming version. You'll actually be able to have an IDE for writing your own exploits. Um, it's actually kind of a cool little thing. It's all on the web. Um, I don't have time, or it, it's also not really 100% complete uh, or, or demonstrable right now. But that's something in the near future would be really cool. And it also has a GUI. This is brand new, it's alpha, it's experimental, uh, but it's written uh, with the GTK libraries, and it's actually pretty cool. Um, the web library can be a little sluggish at times, has to interact with, the, with read lines still, and that's been a big problem for the project. Read lines uh, in Ruby when you're running on Rails is not the best, uh, doesn't have the best support uh, for interacting with the console. It's actually kind of hindered. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is replace uh, the read line implementation with the Ruby read line implementation, pure Ruby, to make this a little more compatible uh, inside the project. So hopefully that'll be done soon and we can kind of move forward with more pressing that. But I said, and the topic of the title in your books is point click root. So let's actually do some hacking. Sure. Funny with such a little strain so far. Um, I, I'm guessing I'm not alone in imagining that um, in this room. I'm more interested in, interested in protecting my websites from people than I am hacking other people's websites. Are you going to address that? No, I'm not. Um, and, I, and actually, web is not what I'm even after. Um, what I'm going to show you is not hacking the web. It's hacking the operating system itself or a extra application hanging out accessible on the net from the operating system. This is, not exact, this is not exactly meant for, for exploits on the web. There are web-based exploits, but they're based on Internet Explorer or the, or the front page extensions in IIS. Uh, they're meant for internal systems running. Go ahead. So other than being employed by the government for, say, cyber warfare, yes. can you tell us some kind of pra practical uses for this that won't get us in trouble? Yes. <laughs> this, the most practical use for Metasploit is actually security research. There are a lot of companies out there doing research on new software coming out, new operating systems coming out, um, you know, the iPhone being one of the biggest things. You know, HD Moore is doing a lot of stuff with the iPhone right now, uh, you know, helping give feedback back to the companies creating these tools to say, hey, you've got a vulnerability. There's a lot of research teams out there working with companies, helping them fix their problems. And this is the biggest uh, win for Metasploit, is that it actually gives a framework to build all this stuff instead of having to do it on your own. So it really is a framework for exploits. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we had a guy tell us he was a sysadmin and he didn't have didn't have everything he needed and they didn't have their system wide set up right. So he used you know Metasploit to basically go in and and hack into all the PCs and, and install the software that he needed to install. Now that is not a proper use for Metasploit. Did everybody hear that? <laughs> no, it was a proper use. It was in the company for this company, <laughs> and he got business work done. He got well, a little value added. Uh, that, you know, if the company was okay with that, then that's cool. But most companies, uh, especially larger corporate companies, will escort you out the door and you usually write to jail without having to go. So I guess that's the case where you've lost your server passwords or something like that. Now, if you, yeah, if you've lost your server password, there's a lot easier ways to get back in the system other than actually exploiting it. Um, hopefully, if you are a good sysadmin, you've got your server patched. And if you have your server patched, nine times out of ten, Metasploit's not going to be able to penetrate it. There are some exploits for, for say, fully patched Windows XP machines can still be exploited via net files. Um, there are some things you can do to still gain control of the system. But really what you're, what you said, what you're talking about is a framework to allow uh, researchers to find new exploits uh, in either new versions of applications or existing versions of applications for the purpose of Patching them before uh, they're ex uh, literally exploited by the 
bad guys. That is correct. I can clarify a little bit that a lot of times the researchers are able to find the vulnerability, but the companies won't believe them. Yes. Until they can demonstrate it, this gives the people who have found the vulnerability an easy way to force the companies to believe that they've got the problem. That is very true. And people will, our companies will pay for exploits. Um, usually in the range of about $1,000 to $4,000 you'll get per exploit. Uh, if you can deliver a complete proof of concept. Uh, sometimes it's more depending on, on certain you know, situations, but uh, there are companies that will pay even up to $10,000 for an exploit if it's a really critical uh, bug. Is, is it illegal in any way, or could you get sued for saying, you know, I have your exploit and I'll only give it to you for, you know, whatever? Uh, so, no. Okay. Technically, all you're doing is saying. Now, if you, there are some rules about full disclosure. If you discover an exploit, uh, you know, you're not 100% le not legally bound, but you're more, more obligated, especially if you're in the security research community, to contact the vendor and say, I've discovered this problem, notify them of it, give them the proof of concept. Um, you know, usually you can work out an agreement where they pay you. If you don't, you can sit on it for 30 days. If they don't patch it, you can go public and disclose it. Um, there are, you have to be very careful about how you go public with it. Um, the nature of it has to be uh, you know, not dubious, you have to really be, be very careful or they can't come after you and, and sue you for all kinds of different things. <laughs> Go ahead. Have you made money this way? Uh, yes, I have. Um, not very much. Um, really in a very small capacity. I don't write a lot of exploits. Um, I've been doing a lot of web development for the past few years. Um, I haven't written an exploit in probably four years. Um, so it's been a while. Um, How do you can, uh, confirm the exploit in the first place without breaking the law? You set it up locally and test it. That's what virtual machines are for. And I'll show you in the demonstration exactly what I'm doing. It's going to be all virtual machine based. So I'm going to first show you some exploit code written in Ruby using the Metasploit framework. And this is the exploit I'm actually going to use uh, here in a couple seconds. Yes, I can. Actually, I'm just going to ahead and zoom in on things here. <coughs> so normally when you write an exploit, you'd have to write a whole lot of C, tax an assembler. You know, there's a lot to writing an exploit and, and packaging it up. Um, you'll actually see here in somewhere around 200 lines of code, I can, com I can code a complete exploit. Still can't read it? It's pretty small still. Okay. Yeah, if you use the TextMate X and log, it's not. I'm not using TextMate. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Can Emacs not increase font size? Uh, I can't. Anybody got a good idea how? Uh, are you trying to? Apple Maps. No, I'm not doing anything. Meta Okay. Just go. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, anyways, this is all downloadable. If you go to metasploit.com, you can download the framework. You can grab it from SVN or you can grab a, a zipped up copy. It has all this uh, included. But essentially, all you see for the top couple lines is just metadata uh, about the exploit itself. It, you literally set a couple options uh, for ports, payloads, locations in the system. Um, you do set up some ad address space. You set up some target space. You register the port and the rest of it becomes checking to see if the operating system or the application you're doing is actually exploitable. Um, if it's not, it's just going to return back saying it's already been patched. Um, and then the rest of it contains basically just uh, some code to pack up the exploit and send it in. And the bulk of the exploit is already over. The rest of it's checks and uh, some socket testing. But really all it does is put it to the socket when it's done and packed up and that's the end of the exploit. So in about 200 lines of code, this completes a full exploit of the Microsoft wins Name resolution, name resolution service. So here's my server. Uh, I chose to go with an older version of a server. I don't want to give anybody any really bad ideas. Um, this, there are a lot of very current exploits. This is old and covered. It's usually patched uh, in anywhere you go if they're even using Windows 2000 anymore. Um, We'll go to the properties, check everything out. 
Well, this is a Windows 2000 machine. It's a base install. It's a service pack four. Everybody knows that's right for, uh, right for exploiting. So I'm going to pull up a shell. Yes, I will. Everybody see that? Okay. So the command line version of Metasploit is not as easy to use. Um, we'll demo the web GUI if we have time. The web GUI really exists and it pulls, pulls everything up for you. You point the exploit you want out, you point the payload you want out, you type in the address and you hit exploit and it's done. Uh, the console is just almost as easy. You just have to type in what you want. So I'm going to show the exploits. Oh, I have to type it properly. It's going to deliver me a list. Our, my font size is a little large, so it's going to be kind of hard to see the name of everything. Uh, but the one I want is actually right at the bottom here. It's the Windows Wins MS 04045 Wins exploit. So we're going to use that. I want to see the targets available. Some exploits range. Uh, from Windows 2000, NT4, all the way up through Windows XP, Windows 2003. This one happens to be just for Windows 2000. Um, if I were to take a step back, log into my other server here, running my stuff. If I were to my server. I see it's got network response. And if I were to end map it, which end map is a tool that just uh, allows you to see the open ports of the system. Um, there's lots of other options you can use on end map. This is very basic. It's uh, not firewalled off, so you're not going to have any problems uh, getting around a firewall in this case. Um, we see a lot of a whole lot of ports open. If we Roll back up a little bit to port 42, we see that it has a name server running, which means that in Windows 2000 land, it's running Wins, uh, unless there's been some configuration to turn that off. Uh, and I know that on Microsoft Service Pack 4 of Server 2000 that this is exploitable. So we'll go back over here. We have known we only have one target, and that's ID of zero, so we're going to go ahead and set our target to zero. I can show payloads in the same way I can show exploits. Uh, again, font size is a little large, it'll be hard to see. There's VNC injection. You can upload your own executable, you can, revert, you can spawn a shell back, uh, you can do really kind of whatever you want. Uh, you can write your own payloads if you feel up to it. Uh, what I want to do is show off the interpreter. That's the Ruby-based stuff anyways, and that's really kind of the coolest that you, that you want to see. So. And there's options on the payload you deliver and how you deliver it. Depending on the network availability, depending on the system, you have to tailor your payload to allow you to get back at it. Um, we're going at this directly. We happen to, this happens to allow us to bind directly to the system. So we're going to go ahead and directly bind via TCP. You can do reverse shells. You can do a, another reverse. Uh, look up and actually listen back for the port to come back to you. you there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, there's lots of documentation about how and why to, to use certain types of, of payload delivery and certain situations as well. So now all I need to do is set the host, the remote host. And exploit the system.
There we go. I am now in the system. So to prove that I'm in the system, let's load some privileges. Um, this is actually a, a module that we can use to go ahead and find out things like the hashes, the processes, things in the system about the system running on the system. I can type ps, I can get all the things running on the system. You know, the standard API extensions are available to you uh, to see what's on the system. Another thing you can do, let's see all the password hashes. <laughs> That's pretty cool, huh? Well, let's go to the IRB. I have IRB, check that out. That's kind of cool. So I can actually enumerate some of these things I've gotten back. I can say client dot, uh, let's see, priv dot Sam hashes. And I get a whole list back, but obviously that's pretty ugly. So let's go ahead and find out the NTLM hash of the very first hash we get back. Um, I want to know who that belongs to, so let's see the username of that. Oh, that's the administrator hash. So I can actually tailor some scripts around manipulating processes on a machine through the IRB. I can actually upload my own Ruby code and exploit it to the interpreter as well. So I can also do things in the way of client. You can see all the processes and manipulate what's going on with them as well. Uh, no, you, there are some ways to kill processes. Um, you can't do it quite as easily from there. Uh, there's some ways to do it actually from, uh, actually we've got about the IRB, and there's some more elegant ways to do it. But speaking of that, Question. go ahead. It's running the IRB on the exploited box? Yes. Okay. It is all in the exploited box. The magic of it, the DLL that's uploaded is only 80K. <laughs> that's kind of cool. The interpreter DLL is, for Windows right now, is 80K. So, it's, it's, in, um, it's in the interpreter, it's in the Metasploit framework. So, I mean, now on the target. No, it's running in memory. It's just in memory. It's just in memory. So, the machine is reproducing. Yes, but you can upload the DLL in the system if you want. If someone did a PSDF, would they be able to see the process of that exploit on that machine? You can't see the process, no. Um, not, not from just regular process. Statistics. You can find the process. It still is running. It's still technically registered. Normal system tools won't see it, but if you're really looking for it, uh, you really can actually find it if you want to. But speaking of processes, we're actually going to take a look at that right now. So, did you say that that's running IRB? Uh, there was an IRB instance that I started inside of that inside of the interpreter. Yes. I see. But the IRB itself doesn't. No, it doesn't. This is a shim down version. It's, it's not a complete IRB. So if we go to the task manager, we have a set of tasks running, but we want to start playing with those. So let's get our process ID. The process ID I'm got registered as 1308. That's what I'm running as right now. I want to execute a process. So I've executed process calc. And if I look on there, I have calc.exe running at the top of the system now. So here's where it gets cool. Why didn't it execute the Why didn't what? Because I'm doing it from the command line. It's only, it only shows up when spawned from the GUI. Um, and Really, calc exe is not the ideal thing to spawn. The ideal thing to spawn is SVC host or some system process you that would normally be running on a system they would see. I want it to be something really identifiable that you would see after I did it though for demonstration purposes. But I'm going to go ahead and migrate to process 744. So now if I get my PID, I'm running as the calc process. Here's the cool part. Let's say, let's say somebody goes, well, I don't see calc running. Why is this here? Let's go ahead and kill it. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> What's that? 
Uh, maybe. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, no, it's not, I tried that. It's not working. I, I, I am outside. I think Parallel Tools is interfering with it, actually. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, hopefully, the video, the, when it comes out, will have a little better way to see this. So, uh, just that box, it said he couldn't quite see it. So one of the other things I want to demonstrate, since we're getting close to running out of time and I still wanted to demonstrate the web client as well, um, is actually the ability to transmit files to the system. This is the upload further dubious programs piece of the slide that you saw earlier. Uh, I'm not going to upload anything dubious. I'm just going to show that you can upload things really easily. Um, so in the root of my Metasploit directory, I guess if I have my other Um, I have, this is where I executed the Metasploit client from. Um, so readme is a really easy choice. Let's just grab the readme file and put it on the system. Oh, <laughs> that, would, that would help. If we go back over here, it says it's uploaded. Oh, went to the wrong window. Oh yeah, I guess it would help if I went there too. Well, README is now on my C drive, and since you guys didn't actually see that, do it again. Now, that's on the system. You can put it wherever you want to. Most likely place you put it is System32. Be very careful, antivirus will see it. Um, so make sure that whatever you're doing as far as uploading files, you're careful not to trip off antivirus, because it will take anything it sees as a bad file and flag it and delete it. Um, there are lots of ways to hide from antivirus. Um, I'm not gonna go into them here. There's a lot of documentation online. Um, but uh, there are a lot of really cool ways to hide from antivirus. Go ahead. You said it actually changed the name of the file. Do you change the name of the system? No, we actually change the actual attributes of the file. There's the set of mace attributes on a file. Um, the command you use is timestomp. Timestomp will uh, have a lot of options. And if we go back here, It actually will let you modify all the all the attributes of the file. Yes, and you can actually blank them all out. That really drives some people crazy. So if you want to just gotcha somebody, you can just wipe all the base attributes out of the file. <laughs> um, are there any questions at this point? So actually, uh, actually, that's a good touch or a good question you ask. I just, how does Metasploit help you develop exploits? Um, so Metasploit helps you develop exploits by not making you write all of the assembler, all the C, all the stuff you don't want to go into that makes you cry. Um, it gives you the ability to use Ruby to write your exploits. Uh, like I showed you that exploit before, all the stuff that was being written was it is translated and packed back down into assembler and sent out. There was a little bit of shell code in that exploit. It doesn't have to happen in all of them. There's, uh, there's some new advancements coming out that's gonna enable you to write everything for me. Um, those are not there. Um, they are coming. However, uh, you know, the biggest advantage of the framework really is all of the availability, all the modules, all the packages already written in Ruby to help you write the exploit. So that's where the big advantage comes in. So, so uh, by having that ability, 
And the easiest way to do that is to run uh, virtual machines. Um, I have hosts of them uh, running on different, different places to test things out. And uh, that's the safest way to do it. Uh, you know, you're guaranteed to you know, do whatever you want, not get in trouble with no consequences. It's, it's a nice thing. And if you're testing, don't test at work. I really highly discourage that, unless you're supposed to. Unless you're encouraged to. If you're in a security role, uh, you know, please don't play with this in improper places. Uh, it really will cause problems. Go ahead. Yeah, when HP Moore um, gave this talk at the Lone Star Ruby Conference, yes. he uh, took a current up-to-date version of XP Pro, fully patched in about 30 seconds, did the, SP, the VNC injection, which means he's running VNC, he installed VNC on this XP computer and had full control of it. Let's do it. Uh, actually, let's do that. So let's go ahead and check out a VNC injection. I'm hoping that the multiple stacks of virtual machines aren't going to interfere with the demo, but I wanted to try anyways. So. That's what I'm going to do. There's nothing interesting here. I'm just going to start the client. It is, a, it is a Rails app. Uh, if you have Mongrel, it will use Mongrel. If you have nothing else, it will use WebBrick. So I assume you are well aware that there's an arms race going on here because while you have good intentions, script kitties out there also yeah. find this very convenient to use, right? Yes, and there is, I mean, that's always going to happen. No matter what security tool you write, somebody with you know, bad intentions is going to get their hands on it and they're going to use it for bad purposes. This elevates the level of effectiveness of script kitties. You know, it takes the threat capability needed for exploiting a system way down. Um, you know, it sets the bar a little higher, which means everybody else has to set their bar a little higher too. So even though it makes for an easier way to attack a system, it forces vendors to create secure systems. What you've done is actually reduce my respect for script kitties because I thought yes. before <laughs> I thought before that they were like really you know really good hackers, but now I realize they're just clicking buttons. Nope. Yeah, I mean really, what you're seeing me do is not hard. <laughs> I mean anybody can do this. What you're about to see me do is even easier. Go ahead. Is there a comparable tool that tests problems to exploit those systems? Uh, this will test for exploits. I mean essentially. Uh, by running this, you, if it's not exploitable, it'll return you back a message saying this system is already patched. But then you, can you use a payload that hasn't been attacked in the system? You know, yes. Okay. Um, if, you, if you were to um, just reverse a shell app, or actually, really anything you're running is running in memory. So if you're, unless you actually go in and change things in the system, uh, do something to, to modify the system itself, <laughs> you haven't impacted anything but the memory. System. Now, there are some exploits that don't clean up after themselves. Um, and they, they're documented. When you see in the models, like, this does not clean up after itself. Um, so you can still leave trace in the system. Are there any frameworks that like wrap this and you can use it for security regression testing? It's a really good question. I don't know. Well, the question he said, is there anything you can do to test for security regression? Uh, any kind of framework that you can wrap this in uh, to do security regression testing? My guess is, the fact that you can write this all in Ruby, you could, you could write an automated tool very quickly. Um, you can hook into any of the libraries here really quickly. 
uh, for those of you who don't start Ruby conference, uh, HD4 actually went into the architecture of that play um, and actually defined a lot of the uh, ways to look into it. Okay. Do you know if there's any collaboration between Metasploit and damn vulnerable Linux to help educate people in the testing? And, and the what Linux? Damn, damn vulnerable Linux. Damn vulnerable Linux. Um, now, what, what I've shown you here is Backtrack. Um, the, the, the actual parallels uh, instance I have running is Backtrack. That is the official uh, team that the Metasploit's working, the Metasploit's working with. Okay. Backtrack is a combination of Wax and Auditor, which were both pen test distros. I noticed the logo looking like Wax. Yes. Um, so Backtrack 2, or this is Backtrack 2, but Backtrack is the evolution of Wax and Auditor combined. Uh, it's running on Slackware. It actually makes uh, really, really nice and modular. You can add your own modules to it. Um, it's a really nice pen test gesture. Just like Dan Vulnerable Linux, it includes every pen test exploit enumeration fuzzing tool on the planet. It's open source and free, even some that aren't. Um, but it's awesome. If, if you're interested in working um, or, or testing in security space, this is an awesome thing to do. It's a live CD. Um, I think it's remoteexploit.org is the address to go get it. Um, it's just the size of a normal CD ISO, uh, runs on Linux, boots right up, uh, and it's a really cool tool. But let's get into this demonstration. I'm running out of time here. So what you see here is kind of a nice little section of things you can, you can grab. I want to grab my exploit. Uh, I'm going to search. It's pulling it up for wins. That's the one I want. I'm going to grab the wins service memory overwrite. It's the one we just did. Second, let's bind a VNC window. Set our target, and let's launch the exploit. Just like I did before at the console, the same thing with a nice little GUI wrapper. This is what you were saying, the slow part, is it has to actually read the IRB alpha, or yes. the console alpha, and, and then send that back up. Using the uh, IRB console from the web is actually where read like falls down in a lot of places. And that's the biggest hindrance is actually trying to use the interpreter from the web section. There's a lot of, it doesn't quite get things right all the time. It's, it, it'll lock up in certain situations. So that's what we're trying to do is replace that with the Ruby relay implementation and make it a little uh, more flexible. But you've seen, it actually spawns a nice little courtesy shell for you too, just to make you feel nice and fuzzy. <laughs> so I'm in the system. And uh, that is the, that was pretty easy, huh? <laughs> so. Uh, this is the power of 100,000 lines of Ruby, 50,000 lines of C, and about 10,000 lines of assembler. Uh, the framework does uh, need help. Um, there are a lot of people actively working on it. You don't have to know anything about security or exploits to help with the framework. Ruby is, is the core framework. Um, they, everybody's looking for really good Ruby hackers to help with the framework. So if you are interested in helping with the project, you can learn a lot uh, about security in the process. Um, the IRC channel is always open. Um, if you go to the Metasploit Framework website uh, at metasploit.com, you can find out more information about getting in touch. Um, it's a very nice community. Uh, they have a very smart community. A lot of people are very interested in security and very, very sharp. Uh, so you can learn a lot by uh, getting that community and asking questions. But that pretty much concludes my demonstration. Had to add that because I just was smashing windows. But are there any questions? I know we've asked a lot already, but are there any follow-ups? Go ahead. So where's, uh, where's Metasploit going next? Right now, Metasploit is going out. Uh, HD Moore has been doing a lot with the iPhone. So pretty shortly uh, here, there should be some iPhone stuff coming out. Um, I, know, I don't know what the stages of everything are there. I know he's been working on them. I know that's about as far as it is. Yeah, they are in the trunk. 
in the trunk of the framework, our iPhone exploits. Um, there's some new ones coming out. Uh, as far as I know, that's his full focus and focus towards that. There hasn't been a significant improvements in the framework recently. Yeah. One is about to launch. Uh, three dot, what you just saw was the trunk of 3.1, um, which is coming out shortly. Um, there will be some new features. I don't know what all is completely defined and what's going to hit yet, uh, but I know that the next few months it should be released. Anything else? Where are some good places to learn more about security issues? The question was, what are some good places to learn about security? Um, what what type what what all are you looking to learn? Well, I mean, just anything, I guess. Like, I, I'm more interested in ones that you think are useful. I think downloadablelinux.com, or whatever their official website is, they have tons of screencasts. Yes. And they give you really awesome introductions. That's true. Uh, learn LearnSecurityOnline.com does have some stuff as well. Um, I don't know if Digital Offense is still up. Uh, Digital Offense was another one. I don't know if that's uh, still around or not. I haven't looked at it for a while, but that was one that I, I've seen before that's quite nice as well. Exploit.org is uh, the Backtrack Framework website. Can I just add OWASP to that? For OWASP, one? yes. OWASP is, 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 is awesome. It's, you know, it's all, all about the web. Um, you know, it is the web security standard, and that's a great place to go if you're trying to learn about web-based security. So on the other hand, there's a, a Twit podcast that's pretty good. I'm sorry? Security Now is a Twit podcast. Security Now, yes. It's very good. It's not, it doesn't get into you know, bits at that level, or, but it's for you know, your average person or programmer who doesn't know anything about security, it's very good. Yes, that's correct. There's a Ruby on Rails security, ROR security.info for yes. a lot of people. It's not a general, it's very focused, obviously, so a lot of people in the security um, but it, go there, but it's good for them. Did everybody hear that? Uh, he said, is it rorsecurity.info? Yeah, I think that. Um, the Ruby on Rails security blog. There's a lot of really good content there. Uh, he posts some stuff. Uh, he, it's not very frequent, but when he does, the content's always very good. Uh, another good resource for this is actually the OpenBSD as a security mailing list, which has a lot of activity on it. OpenBSD is, I, I, all of my servers run on OpenBSD. If you read my blog, I actually have detailed instructions on how to use Ruby on Rails with OpenBSD in the default CH reader Apache. Um, so, if you want to know more about that, there's step-by-step -step copy and paste instructions for that too. But OpenBSD is a great uh, place to go for security. Just, just to raise some polemic here, uh, what, what is the most difficult uh, to break uh, out of the box? Open BSD. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the OpenBSD project hasn't had a exploit in the base install in I don't know, like ten years, I think. No, it's not. Is that, is that not true anymore? Yeah. It's like it's like two years. Two years now. <laughs> okay. They're open BSD. The oh, two in the last ten years. Official word. Um, Theodore Rad, the creator of Open BSD, is really one of the brightest security minds uh, around in a while. Um, he writes a lot of really secure code. He has a very very strong passion for security and uh, won't allow anything bad in the inside of it. So it's very rigorously checked. It's checked to the point where a little bit, it's not cutting edge, you won't have the most bleeding edge things, you don't want that on a server. Um, you know, it really is, it, it can be used as a desktop system, but it's better, most effective as a server, and really it is the most secure uh, out of the box OS. Anything else? We're about out of time. Well, thanks everybody, have a safe trip home. And